Welcome to Retroality TV Presents Reimagine That with Chris Mann, offering refreshing reality with a retro twist. This week, Farrah Fawcett's secret longtime lover, Greg Lott, sounds off on Ryan O'Neill's new book. Hi there, Greg. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you, Chris. Well, thank you so much for joining us here. Really intrigued by, you know, your relationship with Farah through the years. I, you know, saw a little bit from you two or three years ago after Farah passed, which is so shocking to believe it's been almost three years. And you had famously confronted Ryan O'Neill in the street. And, uh, but we haven't heard much from you for a while. So why are you coming well, I was, I was real disappointed. I thought he'd be taller. <laughs> he's taller on camera. <laughs> and he's too short. <laughs> kind of short and fat, you know. <laughs> uh, a departure from the uh, the love story days, I guess. Um, I guess. Well, that was the first time you met Ryan, and, and I guess the only time, right? That's correct. And now you're coming forward, you're really sort of breaking your silence about a lot of things, and what's prompting that, Greg? Well, it's not that I'm breaking my silence. I, I mean, I've, I've told this story before, it's just mm-hmm. that nobody's listened to it. And I don't know and why. And now that He's, now that he's written this book, it's just made me furious because yeah. I feel like he's portrayed her in a negative light, mm-hmm. and uh, that's not at all who she was. And, mm-hmm. and also, I'm going to set the record straight once and for all that after 1996, he was no longer in her life except with a troubled child. Really? That goes contrary to popular opinion or perception, and I read Ryan's new book, Both of Us, and he certainly makes it seem like they had this on-again, off-again thing that was only punctuated by a few years, maybe in the late 90s. Well, they did They did have an on-again, off-again thing until the end of 1996. Ah. It was all for good, and uh, I came back into her life in 1998. Mm-hmm. He didn't know that, and so he's perpetuated this myth, and I was with her until April the 8th, 2009, when he turned the telephones off in her apartment. Wow, and that was right after she came back from her last treatment in, in Germany? For cancer. Absolutely, absolutely. And at that point, it's my understanding that you, uh, her production partner, business partner, Craig Nevius, Kate Jackson, that there were a few people close to Ferret that were just cut off, couldn't see her, couldn't speak to her, and didn't get to then, you know, for the rest of her three months on this earth, or two and a half months. Yeah, and then, then some of us were barred from the funeral, you know? That is amazing. <sighs> Well, let's just, there's so much here to cover. You go back to the 60s with Farah, right? You guys met in college? We met in 1965 at the University of Texas. And you guys were college sweethearts. And tell us a bit about that so we can kind of get an idea of your history with Farah. Because each decade you were in her life and you sort of had a, an on-again, off-again relationship with her, didn't you? Absolutely, for 44 years. And yeah. we met in 1965 and we were together until about uh, 1972, and I was arrested for uh, marijuana in the state of New York and went to the penitentiary for a year. Mm-hmm. And then we got back together in, I think it was 1976 or 77, whenever she was in uh, Acapulco shooting um, Sunburn. Oh, uh-huh. Uh, three of my friends and I drove down there and stayed six weeks, and she was separated from Lee Majors at the time. and. Mm-hmm. Uh, Late 70s. And then I saw her until around oh, 1982 uh, when I got arrested again for a cocaine charge. So yeah. uh, the, the times that, that we were apart were because I did stupid things. And this was 30, 40 years ago, your, yeah. your arrest. I mean, we right. have been on both sides of the equation with addiction in the last 30 years you've had experience in terms of recovery and yeah i've been uh, in recovery since 1987 mm-hmm. june 25th 1987 and wow i've worked in the alcoholism field i've worked at charter plains hospital in lubbock and uh, and i worked in a private prison south of austin texas um that was a model for the prison system in texas and uh, we set that up and then we set up a halfway house program and i i was uh, instrumental in setting up all of those and i worked for the governor and the lieutenant governor at that time wow and, and so that you know I, I look at that as just 
stupid mistakes and I, mm-hmm. you know I've paid my price and I'll be sober this summer uh, 25 years. Wow and you mentioned June 25th which ironically is the day we lost Farah in 2009 that's weird. Yeah, Farah had a wonderful sense of humor I figured that <laughs> you know just in case I might forget she's going to die on the day that I won't ever forget you know wow. I, she's up in heaven laughing about that but uh, <laughs> you know, that's the way she was you know. Well she had a very interesting personality that was certainly anything but one dimensional certainly anything but those glimpses people may have seen on Charlie's Angels or Letterman and you knew her perhaps better than anyone else uh, and certainly the longest in terms of the romantic figures in her life when you read this book of Ryan's, what was your reaction? I mean, what are some of the major issues or discrepancies you see there? Well, you take the first story of the book, and uh, mm-hmm. the story, the truth of that is that Farah and Ryan were in uh, Lake Tahoe with her childhood friend from the third grade at Catholic school, Karen Cox, mm-hmm. her boyfriend, and they were going from Tahoe to Reno for the grand opening of Karen's father's casino that he had bought. Mm-hmm. And Farrah was, you know, very famous, and she made personal appearances, and she got paid for it, and that's where they were going. had nothing to do with going to a church to get married. To Ryan O'Neill. <laughs> yeah. And also, they ran out of gas. It didn't uh-huh. have anything to do with a flat tire. <laughs> so, I don't know why you can't just tell the truth. Wow. It's kind of all downhill after that. And they say the truth is stranger than fiction, and certainly things that have been in the press the last... 30 years, even the last few years about Ryan O'Neill, the truth is dramatic enough. And you said that, of course, she never married Ryan. But really, what happened in 1996 that made them separate? Did they separate at the beginning of 97 or the end of 96? I think the press release was somewhere around February the 24th of 1997. Mm -hmm. I don't know when, I don't know the date of the incident that finally where he mentions in his book and uh, on the reality show that he did with his daughter that Farrah came down to the beach and he was in bed with some other woman. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think along with their opposites about parents and Redmond, uh, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And uh, that was the end of their relationship, period. And when you got back in touch with Farrah in 98, and from there on, she filled you in on... Well, actually, what happened was she called me through her sister, Diana, who I was always very close to. She named one of her sons after me. Mm. She called me, and she wanted my advice because she was doing a pre-sentence report with a probation officer in the trial with James Orr when James Orr beat her. Oh, and God, yeah. so we, we started talking then, and then I separated from my wife in September of uh, 1998, and we started talking seriously on the phone, and... October the 16th, I went out to California, and and we got back together. And we were together, like I said, until April the 8th. Mm -hmm. And I talked to her the night before she went home from St. John's Hospital after coming back from Germany. And I never talked to her again. Now, I've got phone records, Chris, for 10 years of talking to this woman every day, sometimes twice a day. And I've got love letters, and I can't get anybody to understand that Ryan O'Neill was not in her life except with a troubled child. You know, looking back, there are so many different points where their relationship seemed to go south, and even Ryan admits it really got bad when they did this sitcom Good Sports in 1991. But then we would see Ryan and Farah occasionally, like in the reality show, there was an episode where they were sort of dancing, and it would seem romancing, and then we saw him again in the documentary Farah Story, which is sort of a whole other story. I've interviewed Craig Nevius about Ryan's takeover of that project. But how come we would occasionally see Ryan and Farrah together seeming to be flirting or having something other than just co-parenting? Well, one reason that you would is because he had complete control over her son. Mm -hmm. He lived with him at the beach. And the way she placated and did brinksmanship with Ryan was that she would give him his photo ops. And that made him happy. Then he would let her have access to her son. And the Chasing Fair episode, I 
asked her about that, and she said to me, would you have rather been in it? And I said, no. <laughs> you weren't for the Hollywood scene then. No. And, you know, that's you know what made his uh, world go around, so more power to him. And so this son that they shared was really the only linchpin holding them together. Uh, when they separated in 96, he then took Redmond. What was the dynamic then in terms of Farrah needing to placate Ryan to have her son in her life? Well, actually, when he was 12, and I believe it was uh, 1997, he was in a private school, and her sister was looking after him, picking him up and taking him to school, taking Redmond to school, and Farrah was on location, I think, doing the substitute wife, and she got a phone call, and uh, Redmond wasn't at school when Diane went to pick him up. Oh, wow. So... As far as I know, from talking to Farah in California, when you're 12 years old, you can decide who, which parent you want to live with. And since they weren't married, there was no custody, and he chose to go live at the beach uh, uh-huh. for all the obvious reasons, you know. Mm-hmm. And Farah was a disciplinarian, and uh, there were rules in her house, and there were no drugs, and there certainly weren't uh, girls and ryan has sort of always had that reputation of being a, i guess a, a playboy although he says in the book he stopped doing that when he met farah and he indicates in the book that he thought that farah was unfaithful to him first with james Orr when she was working on his movie was it man of the house in 1994 mm-hmm. Well, he seems to conveniently blame other people for everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm talking about this book is because the things that he says about her are not true. That's not true. She had already dismissed him in the press Mm -hmm. before she started going out with James Orr. She might have had four dates with James Orr before he beat her up. Mm -hmm. And, And so, you know, you can call it whatever you want to, but... Ryan O'Neill's a liar. Well, there have certainly been different accounts than Ryan's in the press. Not only Craig in terms of the documentary, but his own children, the two oldest children, or at least his two children with Joanna Moore, Tatum and Griffin, have both contradicted things Ryan has said. You mentioned Ryan blaming, and that was something that struck me when I read the book. There was sort of like this occasional, I guess, effort on his part to seem to take some responsibility. Like he would say, like Joanna Moore, their mother, and I made some dreadful mistakes parenting. Uh, And he would cop to things like emotional insecurity. But then when it got right down to it, he really blamed Joanna for Tatum and Griffin's addictions, saying that they were hardwired. And then for Redman, he blames Griffin, who was living with him in Malibu. And I'm thinking, now, wait a minute. (laughs) You were the parent. Why was Griffin in that house if he was still a bad influence? So I found that was pretty striking about responsibility. Well, you know, he has a drug conviction for methamphetamine. So uh, Mm -hmm. I ought to tell you what's going on. You know, it's his house. He's responsible. And that was in like September of 2008 when he and uh, Redmond were both arrested. Right. What did Farah make of that whole episode? Well, she called me. She'd taken Redmond down to the beach because he had a court date or something. And after the National Enquirer story, she told both of them if there were any more incidences, they would have to deal with the lawyers. They would have to deal with the judges. They'd have to go to court. That she was not going to deal with it anymore. She was too sick and she was tired of it. And so she was going to drop Redmond off. And she'd had a chemo session that day and she was sick. She stayed over in the spare bedroom. And the sheriff's, nine sheriff's guys came at seven o'clock in the morning and took them away wow and she called me about noon and told me the story and uh you know come to find out ryan's trying to tell them that it's not his drugs that they were redmond yeah and so you know that all redmond's on probation at the time he could have gone to penitentiary over that oh my gosh well tatum and i believe griffin both have alleged that ryan introduced them to drugs when they were young and ryan i believe denies that categorically in the book but you look at it and you have three children who are in serious trouble with serious drugs we're not just talking alcohol and marijuana we're talking hardcore drugs and then he has this fourth kid patrick who had a different mother lee taylor young i believe 
And we don't hear much from Patrick, but we did recently. He sort of came to Ryan's defense in an essay for the Huffington Post saying, leave my dad alone. I know my dad. My dad's my hero. But then he also says that he really didn't live with Ryan. Maybe he moved in with Ryan and Farrah when he was in high school. What do you make of Patrick O'Neill's all of a sudden sort of defense of Ryan. Oh, it's just like everything that's going on right now. You know, it's just public relations for this book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's in a tremendous fight with the University of Texas over the Warhol painting. And uh, yes, so, you know, that's set for trial on November 27th. And uh, I wasn't going to say anything as long as this book was just going to be a love story, whatever else he was going to fabricate. But the tone of this and the ugliness of the way he talks about her is just like he talked about her in the Vanity Fair article, and I can't take it anymore. Yeah. That's not the person that she was. She was a wonderful mother, you know. She just didn't want people around that were doing drugs in front of her son, and that was one of the parenting problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, Farrah always had her own home, and she had her own uh, money, and she had her own rules. And if you didn't abide by them, you didn't get to go to her house. Either you were fun or Ryan O'Neill or anybody else. And Farah, I, I think this is an important thing to mention here because sometimes people, I think, seem a little confused by who was Farah because there are times that we would see her in public, like on the Letterman show, where she seemed a bit flighty or maybe incoherent. And then there were other times where she was clearly a take charge, in control businesswoman who didn't sign her contract on Charlie's Angels because they weren't giving her a merchandising deal that she felt was fair. I mean, that was in 1976. So to think that she wouldn't be together in the 90s or 2000s when her son needed her, that's kind of a stretch for people. Well, you know, in the 60s, I tried to get her to smoke pot and and do acid and stuff like that. And she wasn't interested in it then. It's kind of crazy to think all of a sudden when she turned 50, she's just going to turn into a drug addict? Right. I don't think so. She didn't even drink. It didn't make any sense to people who grew up watching her, this athlete, this sort of specimen of health. Well, a little bit of background uh, of the two weeks before the Letterman show. Yeah. She was in the process of editing. She had a final cut in all of me video that was be on pay-per-view, mm-hmm. and she was under the gun because if she didn't make a certain deadline, then they'd take it away from her. They would take it away from her and edit themselves because they were going with that hard day. So mm-hmm. along with that, however many 16-hour days in the editing day, yeah. that was also the period where Redmond went to live with his father. Now, uh. the phones were turned off, and she had no access to her child, and she was sick, and she got run down, and so by the time she got to New York, there were 3,000 people waiting outside the theater, yeah. 1,500 college boys inside screaming her name, mm-hmm. and you didn't hear any of this on the audio because, you know, they edited it, but David lost complete control of that scene, and and she just went into the ditzy blonde that she used to do right. with Johnny Carson to protect herself because she saw that he was going to be uh, ugly to her wow. about the nudity, whether she was she had paint on or not. Uh-huh. And I don't know, you know, there were stories had been planted in the tabloids back in California. That uh-huh. She was using drugs and she was thin and it just caught on and people turned on her. I don't think that people liked her nudity. Uh-huh. You know, she had a European view. Of, of the female form because she was an artist. Right. She didn't see anything wrong with it. But, you know, from then on, uh, you know, she she caught hell. Do you know maybe who, or did she have suspicions about who was planting well, these Rick stories? Well, Richard told her towards the last year of her life, you know, he confided in her and told her that he was planting stories in the globe. Oh, wow. And, and being compensated for it. And it was all part of the O'Neill's, uh, you know, trying to shine the light off of their problems, you know. Wow. So Ryan had Redmond in at least the first part of 97 when they separated. He never lived with his mother from the time he was 12 years old, you know, until she died. He lived at the beach with his father. And that was really when his behavioral problems spiraled out of control at that age. Well, because I had background in uh, treatment, drug and alcohol treatment. I helped her put him in 14 different facilities between, like, 19, I don't want to say 1998 or 1999 when he first went to Casa by the Sea. Mm -hmm. And uh, until, you know, the last one, which, to my knowledge, he never finished a semester of school nor any treatment program from 12 years old 
live until, you know, whatever it is now. Wow. And Farah would go to various lengths to try to help him. Well, she participated in all of the programs that each one of these treatment facilities wanted the parents to be involved in, and Ryan never participated, and he always went and rescued him. Rescued Redmond from the treatment? Yeah, he never finished any of them. Oh my gosh. So this is what she was going through during this whole Letterman Playboy fiasco. Absolutely. People don't know that. In Ryan's book, He portrays Farah as she reaches 50 as being menopausal, temperamental, prone to fits of rage and deep insecurity about her looks. Well, that's interesting, you know, because those two Playboys in 1995 and 1997 sold more copies than any other Playboy issues in the history of Playboy magazine. Yeah. And when I met her again in 1998, of course, she was an incredible athlete. And it's my understanding that some women, you know, they go through menopause late in life. Mm-hmm. And uh, the city Farrell would have been, uh, she'd been 51 then, and she was still had a menstrual cycle. And she was very, very sensual and sexual. I don't know what he's talking about. I didn't find her to be, first of all, I didn't ever see any menopause. And second of all, I didn't see her depressed. And my God, how could you look any better? Right. I, I mean, she was so, a knockout. So she was still the most loving, the most caring, the most thoughtful the sweetest person I have ever known in my life. Another sidebar to that, my mother hadn't seen her in 20 years, and she had become the most famous woman in the world. She was wealthy, and she met my mother again when she had to have eye surgery in Houston, and my mother said, well, my God, you haven't changed a bit. Oh, wow. And my mother hadn't seen her since college. The same Texas girl. Yeah, the same girl from Corpus Christi. She never changed. Despite the James Orr stuff, the Ryan O'Neill stuff. I mean, she was tough. Her dad would tell you, man, she was tough. And she was smart, and she ran her own show. Nobody told her what to do. I mean, people tried to. They didn't last long. Uh And I'm really grateful to Ryan and Lee both because, you know, they blew it gave me another chance. Well, they both seem to have a reputation for being rather controlling. Is that your understanding that they both were... They tried. They tried. They tried, and I mean, I have to say that, you know, Lee's shown more class over the years, but Mm -hmm. you've got to also know that Farrah didn't speak to him for 25 years. So you take Redmond out of the equation, and there's no Ryan O'Neill. And what do you think... Because we've seen Ryan in interviews, and he seems very sad about Ferris passing, and he seems very loving. But then if you do read the book, which I don't think most people in the media who have interviewed him have, there are these references that are less than flattering, and there is a tendency to put a lot of responsibility on Farah for their marriage going south and for maybe Redmond. What do you think is motivating Ryan to be less than loving in in this book? Of all the incidents that I know of, and there's many, 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 many over the 11 years we were together, I think he despised her. I think he hated her guts. I think he was as ugly you could ever be to a person that you had been with. And uh, he was terribly hateful to her all the way through to the very end. Wow. That is certainly not something he's portrayed in the book. And, I, you know, there, I kept waiting for the page or the chapter in the book where he addresses his volatility and his history of being physical and... But he really doesn't. Everything is sort of couched in, you know, my kids provoked me or Farah provoked me. And then there was an incident with Farah leaving Extremities when she was doing the play in New York. Do you know anything about that? Well, the story was is that, you know, she broke her wrist on stage. The truth of the matter is they got in an argument. He, he's a bully. You know, he pushes mm-hmm. people around. And... uh She defended herself. She put her hands up in a boxing stance because she'll fight you. And he hit her in the wrist and broke her wrist. And that's why she left extremity. Wow. So here was this woman who had just gotten all these raves in the burning bed and was doing extremities, would do the movie later, playing this woman that had been victimized, battered. And then this happened to her with James Orr. And to some degree, at least on this one occasion, there was violence with Ryan. Do you think by the time you got back in touch with Farah in 98 that she had had a transformation and realized that 
she was attracted to this kind of a guy and she wasn't going to be doing that anymore? I mean, do you think there's well, a... Well, I'll tell you, this is another interesting story. When I got there in 98, she had 14 stitches in the web of her left hand. Mm. You know, the little web between your thumb and your index finger? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She had 14 stitches in there where it was just torn all the way down. Yikes. You know, it was unbelievable. And so... I asked her what happened, and uh, she'd been introduced to a tennis pro over at the Van Patten's house, where she always played tennis with uh, Nils and... uh, Vince. uh, (laughs) Vince, okay? Because she was real close to them. They had a normal family outside of Hollywood and all that kind of stuff, and Mm -hmm. that was a safe place for her to go, and that's where she played tennis all the time. So she had met this tennis pro, and they'd had a few dates, and then just like her dad would always tell me, everybody that ever meets you, Greg, they want to marry you. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, yeah, well, that's not surprised you know and so once again here she is she's introduced by these people that supposedly know this guy they've been up and down the coast with him uh, all the way from del mar to wherever with these tennis tournaments and uh he ends up wanting to marry her and she says no he loses his temper she's in her little art shed out back of her house and she's trying to pull the two doors together so she can lock it because he's getting violent with her oh my god she tore, you know, the webbing in her hand, and uh, wow. he got freaked out and left. But so I get there on a Friday. On Monday morning at eight o'clock in the morning, here comes this guy beating on her door, going around to the back of the house where they're sliding glass doors, like he's going to break in to her house. And I, I was in the shower, so changed into sweatpants and a hood. And went and got a baseball bat out of the closet, and she said, please don't go out there. You know, it'll just turn into something terrible. Uh-huh. So apparently he saw me. I'm a pretty good size, and he saw me through the wind, and he ran. Oh, my gosh. And I don't. I believe that if I hadn't been there, he would have broken into her house, and she would have been, in, you know, in another situation. Oh, my but God. But you got to know that she's introduced to all these people by reputable people, and she's expecting, like it is here in Texas, that a man's going to be a gentleman. Now, Mm -hmm. if they come come on and they're a con man, then what are you going to do? Is it Mm -hmm. your fault? You know? And and then, then of course, a lot of women stay in relationships with the child, hoping that things will get better so the child won't be traumatized. Right, right. And that's, you know, that's the story. You know, Farrah's just a human being. She's, you know, just because she was an icon didn't mean that she wasn't, you know, normal. And she had her frailties despite being an athlete and a a strong, rather independent woman. Well, yeah, she had her frailties because she inherited some of the things from her mother, and she overcame them with her athleticism and with with the health, food, and vitamins, and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the stress that she was under when I met her again in 1998 was just unbelievable because she had a career. She had this child. She had, you know, take care of the publicity that was going on, that was finally had turned on her. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, she just... Uh, it wore her down. It must have been incredibly overwhelming to have everything amplified by the media. I remember the tabloids were always on her case. Oh, she couldn't go anywhere. We we would go into the valley to the movies because there wasn't any paparazzi there. And we'd go over there and go to eat and stuff like that. That's why we never were photographed. But mm-hmm. Sarah and I had both been famous in college, and we just didn't want to have that kind of relationship again in the public. And we certainly didn't want her son to use me as an excuse to continue to relapse. Oh. And he was a spy for his dad, so mm-hmm. they just didn't know I was in her life. It's none of their business. So that was one of the reasons why you kept it a secret then, because of the red, the Redmond factor? Right. Uh, if you could go back with the luxury of knowing how things turned out with Redmond and such, would you have insisted that Farah move back to Texas? I mean, what would you have done well, differently if you could have? When he was 14, we tried to get him to Provo, Utah, to this program that had a, like a 98% uh, recovery rate. And in the state of California, you have to have both parents' signature on a piece of paper, and Ryan wouldn't sign it. And that was really our last opportunity to get him away to a place where he had a chance. He came to Texas one time and, you know, just turned her father upside down. He was too old to be able to help him and control him and stuff like that. But, you know, he just... uh, 
he just wanted to be a you know a druggie. It's so tragic, particularly given what would become Farah's fate at the end, and to see that her son is still battling all of these demons. You know, we haven't heard a lot from Redmond. We've certainly heard a lot from Tatum and Griffin about Ryan's influence on them. Did Farah ever tell you if Ryan ever you know maybe threatened Farah that she wouldn't see Redmond again? That kind of thing. That what kind of control? he had there of Redmond? Oh, absolutely. When She had to have her father come out in 1996 to make him leave her house, and he told her, going out the door, that he would get back at her with this child. He knew how to do it, and he had done it before. Oh, my and God. He, made, he followed through with that. You know, wow. Absolutely. And that was when he was like 12. Redmond was 12 yeah, years old. Redmond was 12. And, you know, he told Redmond that his mother didn't care anything about either one of them, that all she cared about was money and her career and all this kind of stuff. And it, oh, that's God. just not true. She's a great mother and she had wonderful parenting skills because her parents were wonderful people. And she yes. was tough. She was a disciplinarian. And you're going to get up and you're going to go to school and you're going to learn things. You're not just going to go lay around and be a slug. Yeah. It's not going to happen with her. She was not the kind to sit around and get a pot belly. <laughs> no. Well, and not only that, but if you met her, one of, one of the reasons why she was such a dynamic and she had this aura was because she wanted everybody that she came in touch with to be the best they could be at whatever that was mm. and to inspire people to go do things, you know? Mm-hmm. That's what mm-hmm. she was. She was an inspirational human being, you know, and I think she was put here for that reason. It wasn't just the movies. No, and, and it wasn't just the beauty. I'm, and uh, we certainly, like I said, people really started to get an idea of the layers of Farah with her TV movies in the 80s. Were you in touch with her at all in the 80s? No, I, you know, I, I got out of prison in 1985, and uh, she had Redmond that year, and... <laughs> I just didn't get in touch with her sister. Uh, you know, I just thought, I just mm-hmm. thought, well, you know, they must be happy. They've had a child, yeah. and I just kind of let it go. And then until 1993, Farah called Karen in Austin, her childhood friend, and wanted myself and my wife to come down to Corpus Christi to a battered women's shelter fundraiser. Mm-hmm. And you know, I didn't think that was a very good idea. I told my wife that we were not a very good relationship. And I tried to explain to her, you know, that when Farrah and I got together, that it was magic. And, uh, you know, <laughs> if things weren't right, who knows what might happen, you know? Right. So she's starstruck and wanted to meet her and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, <laughs> we finally went, and uh, Farrah and I saw each other. And we both saw that we were not happy, and it just lightened in the bottle again, you know? In 93. In 93, and then... The next year, she came to Austin and did The Substitute's Wife, and we talked a little bit more, and I saw their relationship was even worse than it had been Wow! with Ryan and the child and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, by, what, 1998, um, when I separated, you know, that's when I called her and I said, life's too short, you know, what do you think? Yeah. And so I made amends to her for the times that I just disappeared in her life because, you know, going to penitentiary after you've been a big hero like me, it's a humbling, embarrassing position, and I certainly didn't want it to reflect on her. Mm-hmm. And, and she didn't deserve to have a connection with a boyfriend who was involved in, in drugs at that time. Because in college, you were like a star football player. I mean, right. you and Farah were sort of like the homecoming king and queen in a way. Right. Well, I was a quarterback, and I was a good one, and uh, and she was one of the campus beauties, and it was the time of my life. I mean, it was wonderful. And uh, But it's always been that way. Mm-hmm. It didn't matter how long Farrah and I would be apart. When we got back together, it was just electric, you know? And it always was that way, always. And you never experienced this sort of menopausal, angry <laughs> no. woman that is depicted in Ryan's book? <laughs> no. No. Now, she had a temper like an oil field worker like her father, and she could spew some language, and she'd fight you, but it was only when, you know, somebody had done her wrong. Had really crossed her. (laughs) Yeah, if you crossed her, that was it. You know, there was no turning back. And and I don't remember anybody that ever crossed her getting a second chance. Yeah. You know, Lee's a perfect example. she, She didn't talk to him for 25 years. Until her last few months on the planet, and they just, they got... 
back in touch via phone. Well, Craig had a project, and, and you know, he kind of pitched it to both of them. And uh, uh-huh. Farrah had, you know, she was a lot easier going because, you know, she had been through hell. Yeah. And uh, there yeah. wasn't any reason to keep grudges anymore. I mean, you know. Yeah. And I guess Lee has uh, made amends. I mean, I think I've read he acknowledged that he was a heavy drinker during their marriage. So to your knowledge, did he sort of take responsibility for his role in that union coming apart with Farrah? Um, I, I don't know what he did. I, you know, we didn't ever talk about what he did or what he didn't do. I, yeah. I mean, I know what drove him apart was, you know, he didn't come home. He was out with the boys. He drank too much. Yeah. You know, everybody was doing cocaine back then. I was. And, yeah. and uh, you know, she was working. And when she works, she works. She's a professional. And uh, all that crap about having dinner waiting for her, that's a bunch of crap. That's just People magazine. That it was in her contract that she had to leave Charlie's Angels by a certain time to make dinner for Lee. Yeah, that's just a crock. That's a crock. And that's why she left the show, so she could be there to make well, him dinner. Well, she certainly didn't you know, wait for him uh, to get the phone call to get naked and get in bed. Which is what Ryan says in his book. Right. I mean, how stupid is that? And why would somebody say that? Is that not mean-spirited, or am I missing something? Because it's certainly not true. And that's the thing. It's like when Ryan has done publicity for the book, he has seemed very soft-spoken, very loving of Farrah. But if you read the book, it's sort of like this other thing. And then he has made comments that are seemingly a joke in various interviews, like when he said that he nodded Farrah's head, you know, when he asked her to Until he found out in California she has to say yes. I mean, when she was ill, that he nodded her head, yes, that she would marry him. I mean, what do you make of how things ended for Ryan and Farrah? Because it would seem to the public that Ryan was there by her her side and he was there in her final months and that there was this love story ending how was it really and where do you think ryan was left emotionally in terms of the way things ended with Farah? well i really don't understand why uh i was never able to talk to her again i mean we had a business together we were partners in a website mm-hmm. i stayed there for the three months from the time when easter until she died and hoping that i would get to see her and yet you know I was put on a list where I could not contact her, and there was a power of attorney. I was told that he had power of attorney, and she didn't want to see anybody anymore, okay? But out of the 44 years that I knew Farrah, if you were inside her family, if you were a loved one, if you were her parents, there was an unwritten rule that if there was a major situation where you needed to hear from her directly, I don't want to see you ever again, you're not allowed on the set, blah, 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 whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. If you didn't hear it from her lips, you were not to accept any of that from an assistant, from an agent, from a business manager, from nobody. From an ex-husband or an (laughs) ex-lover? Exactly, especially not him. Yeah. And I didn't accept that, and and I'm still not going to accept it. And uh, you've interviewed Craig. You know what happened. Yes. I am still, to this day, stunned. She had formed a a business with him also. They were... Just like me. Just like you. And... But yet, she would let herself be shown on camera for the documentary looking so ravaged, but she didn't want the two of you or Kate Jackson to see her when she came back to Germany. It doesn't make sense. And the, really, well, there was only a small group of people that had access to her at that point. Farrah had three telephone lines. She had a main line. Well, actually, there was four ways you could get her. There was a phone that went directly from the desk downstairs in her condo to the apartment, okay? Uh And she had a line one, which was for the public, for the agents, for her career. Then she had a private line that only her parents and me had and her son. And then she had a third line, which was a fax line, okay? Mm-hmm. I mean, a cell phone, I'm sorry. And, and she had a fax line as well. So when all of those forms of communication were stopped, now you got to know she's got a son that's shooting heroin. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. as a mother, you don't ever turn your telephones off, right. okay? And, and I never knew her in her entire life to not talk to her father every morning of her 60 years. Wow. And he was in his 90s at that point, but he couldn't come back to see her, but he was still very alert mentally. Well, he could certainly.
certainly talked to her over the phone, which didn't happen. You know, I called him and wanted to know what to do. And then he finally asked me to go out there and find out what was wrong. Oh, my God. Which is what I did. And uh, I told him what was wrong, and, and he didn't believe me. He was not as well as I had been led to believe, you know. Uh-huh. I've since talked to Pharaoh's stepmother, his wife that he married after her mother died, and, uh, you know, he was real sick. He was incapable of doing anything wow. about what was going on. But once the power of attorney was given to Bernie Francis, there was nothing anybody could do anyway. And for people who don't know, Bernie Francis is the trustee of her estate, and he's also Ryan's business manager? Yeah, for over 30 years. And he was Pharaoh's, you know, for a long time until they separated, and she got other representation, and then she ended up back with Bernie. But you've got to understand that Pharaoh signed her own check and she looked over everything that went through her life Mm -hmm. she didn't just have somebody who had carte blanche to manage her money Mm -hmm. i mean she gave bernie money from time to time that he invested in real estate syndicates and stuff like that but because of his long-term relationship those last three years of her life she would never entrust bernie francis or ryan o'neill with her life with her life savings, with her estate, with anything, because after the 91 incident with good sports, she told Ryan that she would never, ever do business with him again. So can you give us an idea what happened on good sports? Because Ryan talks about it in his book. Well, Farrah told me that she owned a piece of the show and that Ryan wanted to control the project and that he would come to the set every day and throw fits and oh. literally drove off uh, directors and writers and, wow. you know, sabotage the show. And, and she told me after that that she would never, ever have to do a project with him ever again. And they never got married. And here's the thing about Farah that has always sort of mystified me relative to the final months of her life, as we know them to have occurred, or what we've read. For her to be a co-owner of her own sitcom in 1990, she knew her game, she knew the business, and it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense that she would, you know, stop dealing with you, stop talking to you and Craig and all of these businesses businesses and all of these relationships she had cultivated, all of a sudden she just ditched them? It doesn't add up to me as a reader. No, she would never do that. We had talked, you know, between 2006 and the last time I talked to her right before Easter, and and we'd talked about uh, her future and what she planned to do with her will and all that kind of stuff, and yeah. she would have never turned over the video, her video diaries, what she called it, a wing and a prayer. She would have never turned that over to Ryan or Bernie, and Mm -hmm. she certainly would have never turned her estate over to Bernie Francis. You know, one thing I noticed, we were talking about Good Sports 9091. Isn't 1991 the date that's listed on her living trust, which is the document the public knows as her, quote, final will? What's that significance of 91 relative to the living trust, and is there a will? What's going on there? Well, Farrah called me middle of December 2006 and and wanted to know what I wanted from her will and and I told her that I didn't want anything and I didn't want to talk about something like that because you know we had a long way to go as far as her treatments and I thought that she was going to be successful mm-hmm. but she was adamant about it and said that uh, she had to make a will and her father was making her do it and Bernie was making her do it and and so I just assumed that it was made that way Mm-hmm. Come to find out, there's some kind of living trust that dates back to 1991, and the final was the third edition of that. Ah. However, the entire time that I've known Farah, she never mentioned to me one time about a living trust ever. Really? So I, I don't know where this living trust comes from. But I know that many of the things that are in that living trust were not what we had talked about. Can you give an example or two as to the details of that, what you mean? Well, she was estranged from her nephew over some uh, money that she had loaned him, and they weren't speaking, and I just know her. She would never leave him money, nor the contents of her condo, jewelry, and a car that was leased, by the way. Oh, wow. It doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, she Mm -hmm. had all of her mother's silver, 
and crystal and all that kind of stuff, she would never give that to, or her jewelry. That would be passed down to Redmond. Now, the issue of having access to her condo, that is uh, a controversial issue because the last two and a half months of Farah's life, weren't there only a very select few who had access to that condo, who could see Farah? I mean, Kate Jackson was even sent away. Right. There were just like a handful so I, of people. I went, I went to the condo the day before Easter. I, something was wrong. I didn't hear from Farah after she had told me she would call me uh, when she got home from St. John's. I flew out to California, which was very unusual for me to do that without talking to her first. And I got to the Wilshire condo, and I'd been going there for the better part of 10 years, and uh, they treated me as if I was some kind of leper. And I went up to the desk because you have to have them announce up to the condo that so-and-so is here, and they would have to talk to Farrah and make sure everything was okay. So they would not even call up to the condo. They wow. said that I would have to wait until Monday when the building manager, Donna, I can't think of her name right now, but Donna would be there, and then I could talk to her about it. Wow. Well, by Monday, I went to see Donna, and Donna is hostile as well and says that she hasn't seen Farah, but that Ryan O'Neill is in charge of the condo, and there are no visitors to be allowed. Farah doesn't want to see anybody. Blah, 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 blah. Uh-huh. So I tried to call her father, and her father was too ill to talk at that point. And um, you know, I don't have any allies in this anymore. But, but I do know, based on our 44-year friendship, that you don't hear something like this from someone other than Farrah Fawcett if she doesn't want to see anybody. Wow. So you travel 1,500 miles and aren't given access to a woman you've known for 44 years to say goodbye, to see her, to check on her welfare. That's, uh, wow. So, so then I asked Donna Curry is her name, because I've known her all these years, you know, what gave Ryan O'Neill the right to decide who would be uh, given access to Farrah? And she said it was her understanding that he had power of attorney. And I said, Ah. have you seen it? And she said, no. And I said, well, I'd like for you to take a note up to her and get her to respond to that to you. Yeah. And she said she would. Did you ever hear that? She never did that. And to my knowledge, I never heard whether she, you know, I called her back and and she wouldn't take my call. So I don't even know whether she ever saw it or not. So this power of attorney... It's a little confusing for some people because there are a number of documents involved here in 2008, 2007, along that time frame, Farah had signed an agreement to form a a business, a production company, I guess, with Craig Nevius. And then in April of 2009, she signed power over to Ryan. What, can you fill us in? She signed it over to Bernie, and then Bernie signed it over to Ryan. And the signature is scribbly at best, and it has like two H's at the end of Farah, and it has three T's at the end of Fawcett. Wow. And then there were other documents during this time, one of them which was signed Farah Fawcett Fawcett. Oh my gosh. So does that indicate to you that it was her hand, but her mind was, and her hand weren't coordinated, or that it well, wasn't it even her hand? It doesn't sound like that she was uh, in any condition to be signing major documents in her life. Gee whiz. I mean, again, I have to go back to even Charlie's Angels. Here, Farah was so shrewd. She had this deal with the poster company that did the poster, where she was a profit participant in that. Ultimately, I think she had, you know, the control of the copyright. She didn't sign that Charlie's Angels contract because they wouldn't give her what she felt was a fair deal on merchandising. This is 1976, so 2009 for her to all of a sudden sign these huge, overwhelming documents, it it just doesn't seem to add up. No, she would have never done that. That's just not the way she did business, and, uh, you know, she was certainly would have talked to her father about things like this, which she never did. And they, or Craig Nevius, who, you know, was pretty much ran her 
contact with the entertainment industry. You know, he was everything to her. What did you know about Farah as a businesswoman, as a woman who was able to negotiate a deal or walk away from a deal if it wasn't good for her? I mean, what did you know about that aspect of her? Well, she was brilliant. She was, uh, you know, by this time, she'd been in the business 38 years or more, and, and she knew how to read her own contracts. She negotiated all the terms of those kind of deals that it was really funny. She always said that she liked six zeros with a number in front of it. Uh-huh. And, and and the way the way she negotiated a contract like that, that was pretty much the way it was going to be. And if somebody came back with another offer, then she doubled the first number. And by the third time, if they came back, then she said that she would never talk to him again. Wow. She'd just walk away from it. So. She was shrewd, and she knew what her worth was, and she knew what she wanted for doing a project, and uh, that's the way it was. And so for it to end the way it did, it's just beyond belief. It's so hard to compute, even just as, like I said, a reader, as someone who's followed her life. It doesn't add up. Now, getting back to the condo, I recall an article that was written last year, I believe, by the New York Times about the control of the documentary being taken over by Ryan in spring of 2009. Craig was then essentially cut out. In that story, it talked about a woman named Mela Murphy who was around when Farah was being encouraged or whatever word you might want to use to sign one of these documents. Have you talked to her? I mean, we're talking Ryan, Alana, and Mela were the three that were there in that condo during those final months, to your knowledge? Yeah, Mela was there the whole time. Mela was her hairdresser and her makeup artist for all the years that when she was on uh, location during the project. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, I met Mela a couple of times. And, but she was there during the whole last three months. And at any time, she could have changed the way events unfolded, and then she chose not to. So I don't have much regard for her. But uh, my understanding was that NBC flew out representatives to discuss the Wing and a Prayer documentary. Mm -hmm. And believe this or not, this is just so terrible. The meeting took place in Farrah's living room for six hours between Brian O'Neill, Alana Stewart, and whoever the NBC people were, and Farrah's in the bedroom pretty much in a comatose state with a nurse. Oh, my gosh. So that's when the negotiations changed from Sweetened by Risk then was the company that Craig Nevis and Farrah had that controlled the video. And, uh, of course, the deal had already been made. And they switched allegiances to Ryan O'Neill and went with it, re-edited it, and changed it to Farrah's story. I also understand that Alana had wanted a pretty big pay hike from Craig, and that Farrah wouldn't agree to that. So now all of a sudden, it's Ryan and Alana and NBC, and then we see the final product. Did that surprise you that this took that turn of events? Well, I, I've never seen it. I, her father asked me to fly back out to California and try to help him see what was going on with this. And I actually was on an airplane on May the 15th and got mm. to Burbank about the time the, the show was on. So I've really never seen it. I, yeah. I've seen enough of a wing and a prayer to know what her vision was mm-hmm. and, and what her hope and, and what her focus was. And that was on giving people, you know, a positive uh, hope to do whatever they had to do to survive cancer. And if that meant mm-hmm. going outside of American medicine, well, then that's what was important because what Farrah did, she went to Germany because she had been given a death sentence. We don't treat liver cancer in this country. And she went to Germany because there was a doctor there, Dr. Vogel mm-hmm. in um, Frankfurt, that treats liver cancer. And that's what she had to do because it had metastasized to her liver. Mm-hmm. And she went there and, and barely made it. And they kept her alive for three years. So yeah. she was a fighter. And, and, and that's what that wing in a prayer was going to be about. Not about Ryan O'Neill, Alana Stewart, or any of this so-called love story crap that he came up with. These people, this is their legacy, and like vultures, they're going to ride Ferris Carcass till, you know, till the day they die, obviously. And Alana had a book come out very shortly after Farrah passed. I've read there are issues, and this ties back into the condo 
that Farah had all of these journals, that Farah kept all of this stuff in archives. And what is the status of her archives, of her journals, and what do you make of the access that Ryan and Alana had to the condo in her final months? Well, she wrote in journals every day of her life from the time that she got to California until you know, until she couldn't write anymore, I guess. And all of those, as far as I know, archival, you know, has gone into the estate. And uh, I don't know. I don't know a lot of Hamilton Stewart. Uh, you, you would think after 44 years of knowing Farrah that I would meet her. Right. But I'd never met her. And in fact, during this time, that Farrah was, uh, you know, incapacitated. I called her best friend from the third grade in Catholic school, a woman named Karen Cox. So I called Karen Cox to see if I could get her take on a lot of Hamilton Stewart. And she said that she might have met her once, but uh, as far as she knew, Alana was never invited to Farrah's home in 25 years to the home at 3130 on Pella Road. So wow. I just find that to be incredible to hear when, in fact, this woman is purporting to be her best friend from 30 years which I know is just, you know, it's just like everything that Ryan O'Neill says. She's a liar. And um, anyway, by this time, I was horrified because these people are controlling Farrah Fawcett's life. Mm -hmm. And they're in her condo, which now you are barred from getting into in April, May, and June of 2009. Right. When do you think Ryan really found out about you? Because he has acted like in the past that he didn't know about you. But do you think that he found out about you in spring of 2009? Oh, I think he found out about me that week of after Easter because I wouldn't leave, you know, I kept mm -hmm. going back to the condo and these documents weren't signed until April the 20th. Mm -hmm. We changed everything over to Bernie Francis and Ryan O'Neill. So I think I was a terrible threat to all of that because I was trying to get in to see her to find out why this was being done without any access because you got to know also at that time, we had a website together, and uh -huh. everything that went on that website, whether it be news of her life or new merchandise or whatever, like things like that, they had to be cleared through her. She had final say, and uh -huh. we were partners in this, and I, as a business person, could not access my partner. Right. Much less, you know, that she was my girlfriend. We've seen some of the letters that she's written you. I'm sure she saved letters you had written her. Do you think that Ryan found those? Oh, yeah, they were in the safe. They got all the tape that were the rough cuts of a wing and a prayer, and they, they got into her safe and found all that stuff. Oh, know, wow. Whoever that was. But uh, this was all done during those two weeks uh, after Easter, and uh, I don't know. You know, we had, Noah was uh, still in contact with outside sources at that time, and, and we were getting a report uh, about what was going on. And uh, I see. You know, one day, it would be that she, I was doing fine, and then the next day, you no, know, she's not talking. She's, you know, heavily sedated. So it's, it's just hard to say. I, I was there for almost all of that time until she died. And, oh, my God. Uh, it, it was a terrible terrible ordeal. You were in the Los Angeles area during that yes, time? Yes, I stayed in Westwood the whole time, hoping to see her. Oh my God, how agonizing that must have oh, been terrible. for you. Oh, it was horrible. You know, you had mentioned a safe, and that reminded me of a comment that Ryan made to Vanity Fair. I guess it was a joke about the combination to the safe. What do you make of comments like that that are seemingly jokes on Ryan's part? Well, it's interesting that I believe his quote was, we think she's worth $25 million, but we can't get the combination of the safe. Uh, well, you know, that's roughly what I think her estate probably was worth. Wow. And yet, I think that the Living Trust was around $6 million, counting what uh, Redmond got. And yet, where's the rest of the money? Yeah, the other 75%. <laughs> yeah, where is it? It's certainly not in the foundation, which is another complete mystery to me because Farrell was still negotiating with the doctors at UCLA to form a foundation in her name with a wing to be dedicated to her with a possibility that, you know, they would put up as much as $10 million into this foundation. So they were still 
uh, having negotiations about things like that. So I know for a fact she didn't have a foundation because she didn't really understand which one was which. Uh You know, there's public foundations and there's private foundations. And she told me she certainly wasn't going to put her own money into a foundation. Didn't she have something at some point that was talked about called the Fight the Fight Foundation? Was that a part of her plan? Well, we, you know, Farrah, here's the way Farrah made decisions. She was brilliant about this. She would go around to maybe 10 different people and that were, say, they knew about foundations, for instance, mm-hmm. or they knew about a film that she was working on. And she would gather information and she'd put it all in a pile then she'd go through it, disseminate it, and then she'd make her decision. And that's what she was doing about this foundation. She hadn't made up her mind yet. Mm. She would have told me if she had. And the way it has been presented since Farah passed was that this was Farah's wish, as articulated, I guess, to Alana, that it be the Farah Fawcett Foundation. And then, Chris, how come it wasn't announced until after she died? And didn't Farah's father ask for donations to be sent to the American Cancer Society? Yeah. Does that give you any indication of how he felt about it? That's interesting. Okay, so we've, we've got the issue of the foundation, the estate the value of the estate. All of these things are part of this ongoing investigation by the California State Attorney General's office. What can you tell us about the status of that situation? Well, they contacted me, and uh, they wanted to know information about, you know, where I thought her wishes were. And I let them know exactly what I thought, like what we're talking about now. And Mm -hmm. as far as I know, this is an ongoing investigation both into her estate and into the foundation, that I guess next month will come up on a year. Wow. But at the time, Alana Stewart countered by saying it was just more of a routine look into the books. I I forget the terminology she used. I think it was a cursory audit, wasn't it? Audit, right. That's right. And it's interesting that we haven't heard from her since. Uh, That was October of last year, and we haven't heard from her. No red carpets, no big donations from the foundation. No children's hospital stuff at Christmas. Uh-huh. None of that stuff. She's just absolutely vaporized for the time being. So uh-huh. I, I'd say this is a very, very important investigation. If it's still ongoing, coming up on a year, what connection does that ongoing investigation, you think, have with the University of Texas's ongoing lawsuit against Ryan over the Warhol, which both of those Warhols, weren't they documented as being in Farrah's Wilshire condo in her final months or years? My understanding is that there's video from Farrah's story of someone, I guess this was Alana, she filmed everything, walking down the hallway. I mean, actually in the living room because the one more hall always hung over the fireplace in the living room and then going down the hallway to Ferris bedroom where the other one was uh right i've seen that with the dates uh, on the video so oh, wow that was uh, before she died so as long as i've known farah and, and i was in her house at, at antillo many times those two war halls were always in her possession as far as I can remember. And that was 1980. And the house at Antello, that was the home that she had originally shared with Lee Majors, and then she right. maintained that residence until the earthquake in the 90s mm-hmm. in L.A.? Absolutely. And I know for uh, because when I went and I made the uh, inventory of all of her artwork, all of her art was scheduled on an insurance form individually mm-hmm. with numbers and locations and and that's what I had to do. I had to update what was you know archival because it was moved from Antello. Mm-hmm. The University of Texas's lawsuit. That of course is your alma mater. Did you have any role in this investigation or this situation? Well, when I found out that the University of Texas. Uh, had been given this bequeath and her living trust. I contacted the assistant dean of the art school. I figured that's where it would go. And I gave her this inventory just so that she'd have something to compare it to. Then she gets back in touch with me and says that the chancellor's office has been notified of the uh, the gift. Mm-hmm. So I asked her to forward that on to the chancellor's office. Then I decided I'd better follow that up. So I went online and found out who the people were that were on the board of regents. They're the ones who uh, 
say what's going to happen at the University of Texas. And uh, lo and behold, one of my teammates that I played football with is chairman of the Board of Regents. So wow. I contacted this man, and I thought, this is a godsend because, you know, if anything goes wrong here, he needs to know about it. And uh, I told him what my thoughts were, and uh, he got me in touch with the lawyers for the Board of Regents. Well, wasn't too much longer after that, they got a letter from Farrell Fawcett's estate with Bernie Francis as trustee, notifying them that Bernie Francis had decided that they were not going to send her personal objects of art that she had created. Oh. They had deemed them not to be in her art bequeath, whatever you want to call it. So uh -huh. eight months, they went back and forth with each other until they finally settled on the final inventory of her artwork, art objects, collection, personal creations, what have you. And they came down to the fact that there are two things missing. One was a napkin from Warhol that was the lips mm -hmm. that you see in the picture of the fat folk from the beach standing beside the, <laughs> uh, those two framed um, napkins in the Vanity Fair picture, mm -hmm. and one of the Warhol portraits of Fair. So the University of Texas, you know, tried to get the lawyers for the estate to uh, come up with those and uh, said that they didn't know anything about them. And so the University of Texas is in a lawsuit to be heard November 27th. And unlike Craig Nevius, who had been sued by the estate, the University of Texas has quite a lot of money to fight this battle. Do you anticipate this definitely going to well, trial? Funny that you speak about that because not only did the University of Texas sue Ryan O'Neill for these objects of art, but he turned around and sued them just like the law firm sued Craig. Right. Except in this case, I believe the University of Texas, from what I've been told, has enough money to get to trial. Yeah. No matter how long it takes. I've read that they have quite a large endowment <laughs> for these types of I think it's second only to Harvard. Wow. So this is a story that we expect to hear more about in the coming months. Do you think that this investigation and or the lawsuit in the process of discovery and litigation, do you think this is going to bring to light documents such as a will versus a living trust, other evidence that may, you know, illuminate what has happened over the last several years with Farrah's estate? Well, I certainly hope so, because, you know, otherwise, and I'm going to write about it in my book, yeah. but we need to have the justice system uh, work to make sure that what her wishes were and um, what her estate was to be and contents to her son and uh, art to the university, that needs to be uh, upheld. And if a court has to do that, then so be it. You know, I want to ask you here in a moment more about your relationship with Farah and versus some things Ryan has written about Farah in his new book, The Both of Us. But one or two more questions regarding the estate. Have you ever spoken to Bernie Francis? Do you know him? Well, I called Mr. Francis, and I think I shocked him because I had his cell phone. And I called him uh, during the time, I guess it was after Farrah had passed away, and I called him because I wanted to see what his take was on the, yeah, it must have been after, because I wanted to see what his take was on the living trust. And before we could ever get into details, he answered the phone as Richard D. Francis, and I said, hi, Bernie, how you doing? And kind of shook him up a little bit, I think, <laughs> because I know everything there is to know about his relationship with Farrah over 25 years or more, oh, and wow. he didn't know anything about me, so... And before we could ever get into any details of all this stuff, he said, Greg, I don't even know what your problem is. Uh, all this was done legally. Oh. And I thought that was an incredible statement when we haven't even gotten into the this or that. It's interesting that he would say that. What did you make of that? Or what have you made of that in the years since? Well, I just don't think, you know, things are on the up and up. I mean, I know enough. From what Mella said, when these documents were presented to Farrah, that she did not want to sign these and that they were continually put in front of her over a week's period until finally, you know, we have these what I call medicated signatures. Mm -hmm. and, and they're very important because I know that Farrah would have never entrusted the final days of her life. In other words, 
if she had to be taken off life support or whatever, that document would have been in the hands of her father. Yeah, her father, who she remained so close with, and he was a pretty together, I mean, he was still pretty active and alert even when he was 90, is that right? Right. Now, I would say the last year of her life, he wasn't as active. He had a lot of different illnesses, and in fact, she was notified on that last trip to Germany as if she didn't have enough stuff on her plate that he had lung cancer. So, oh my God! Um, I just uh, know that uh, none of this would have been done the way it was done if her father was still active, because everything that she did was cleared through him. And my conversations with him. Uh, or he was not happy with Bernie Francis. You know, knowing Farah the way you did, what do you think she'd say if she could, you know, speak down from the heavens uh, about the last few months of her life and these documents and people being cut out and all of this kind of stuff? What do you think she um, would say? Bullets would be flying. <laughs> Literally. Real bullets, not Charlie's Angels bullets. <laughs> No, they would not be blanks, you know. <laughs> I mean, if she'll go after a drug dealer with a box cutter, you can imagine what she'd do about this kind of stuff. And that's an interesting statement you just made about going after a drug dealer. Wasn't there a story, like in the National Enquirer, that she had gone after a guy that was selling Redmond drugs? Oh, yeah. She called me one night, and uh, she had Redmond in, in tow, and they were on their way to a drug dealer's house that had called her on her phone looking for Redmond, and it pissed her off. So she got Redmond and made him tell her what the address was, and she took her box cutter that she always carried with her in her car and she went over to this guy's house in Venice Wow! and banged on the door, got in the house, took his keys and his ID and called the police. Wow. And the police came and told her, you know, you can't do this as a vigilante justice and all that. But she wanted her son to see that she was standing up for him and that she wanted this guy to know how serious she was about him intruding on hers and her son's life. And, and I tried to get her not to do this, but, you know, you can't do things like that. She was a lioness, and she's uh -huh. protecting her cub. And uh, anyway, the guy moved, never contacted her son again. Wow. I think because Redmond has been in the news many times, his run-ins with the law and such in the last three years, people may not know what kind of a mother Farah was and now we've got Ryan's book that may not paint the most accurate picture of what kind of mother she was. Can you take us back to the position she was in when she split from Ryan O'Neill in 96, 97 relative to Redmond and what access and control she had over his teenage years? Well, she had had her sister come out to California to look after Redmond because she had to go make a film called A Man of the House in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. I think this was in 97. And uh, mm -hmm. she got this hysterical phone call from her sister one day. And Diane, her sister, had gone to pick Redmond up at school. He wasn't there. So she didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Tries calling the beach to Ryan's house, and he won't answer the phone. So what had happened was Ryan had gone and picked Redmond up and taken him to the beach and told him terrible lies about his mother that she didn't care anything about him. All she cared about was money and her career and blah, blah, blah. Well, I think Redmond was 12, and in California, you can decide which parents you want to live with. And, of course, they had joint custody, and they'd never been married. So he chose to live at the beach, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And to tell you the truth, uh, for the most part, except when he would be so ill, he'd have to go to the hospital or to treatment. He stayed with his father until his mother died. Oh, my gosh. So she didn't raise this boy from 12 on. She didn't have anything to do with his addiction or anything else, you know, because her rules of her house, there weren't big any drugs there. But she tried to get and did get him into treatment, even like in Mexico, right? Oh, yeah. That, that, that That's the first treatment program. And, and there were some uh, mistakes made in that because Redmond was seeing a therapist that had been recommended to Farrah by her doctor. And the guy turned out to be a headhunter, which means he was recommending to families that they go to certain treatment facilities. Well, we, we didn't know that Pasa by the Sea down in Mexico was not a 12-step program. It was a behavior, conduct behavior program. Mm. And so he spent about 18 months out of the 22 that were allotted. 
uh, without, you know, having the drug issue, uh, you know, they did not address it. And so uh-huh. even though he learned how to make his bed and do chores and all that kind of stuff, which is great, and also he speaks fluent Spanish, his drug issue wasn't addressed. And so uh. finally there was a time for the family week, you know, where the family comes and uh, the counselors and the child uh, address the parents and their role in the addiction. And Ryan shows up in a brand new PT cruiser that he wants to give to Redmond. Well, Redmond was 14 and he didn't have a driver's license. Wow. And that's probably good fair not to go down there in Ryan's control. And she said, no, it'll be all right. Well, you know, it wasn't all right. And she was all harried in a hurry to go and all that. Well, she ends up with no money and no uh, identification with her. In Mexico. So in Mexico. So she didn't realize this until what happened happened. And uh-huh. they give uh, Redmond a 24-hour pass. And he goes back to the motel with his parents. And Ryan announces that they're leaving the next day. Mm-hmm. And oh Sarah says, gosh. well, I'm not going. So we need to contact the facility. We need to talk to the counselors and let them know and all this kind of stuff. He said, well, I'm not doing that. We're leaving. So the next morning, Farrah stood her ground, and they go out and get ready to leave. She realizes she didn't have her purse. She didn't have any identification and no money. Mm-hmm. So Redmond comes back in, gives her $50, and they left her in Mexico. 50 bucks? She's 40 or 50 miles from the border. So the, the facility sent a van and they took her up to Tijuana. She crossed the border on foot, took a cab to the train station in San Diego and took the train. She called me from the train station and she took a train home to uh, Los Angeles and took a cab to her house. Oh, wow. And Ryan wanted to show her the control that he had over this child and who was the boss. And, and that's what he continued to do for the rest of uh, her life. And she had to play the game of brinksmanship where she would give him his photo op, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. included chasing for uh, the segment of there or photo ops at the gym or he'd show up with paparazzi in the basement of the UCLA Medical Center. And, you know, that was a game that was played. And so she would have to do things that she wouldn't ordinarily do to have access to her son, who was a total heroin addict by this time. Oh, my God. Even Griffin couldn't control him. You know, Greg, one question that pops into my mind is why didn't Farrah just stop and take Redmond and move back to Texas? And you guys could have had a more yeah. normal existence for this kid. You know, I worked for a hospital called Charter hospital and it had facilities all over the country and I worked for them for a long time and one of the doctors that was considered to be the primary physician in adolescent drug treatment had taken over when Charter finally sold out he had taken over their facility in Provo Utah and I contacted him and I think Redmond was 14 at this time and he was willing to take him for a two-year period. And it was the only lockdown facility. In other words, he couldn't leave. He'd have to stay there and go through their program and couldn't go out and get drugs or nobody could bring drugs into the facility. There weren't any other facilities like that, certainly not in California. Mm-hmm. Well, I felt like I still do that that was our big opportunity to change this child. And in California, you have to have both parents sign a waiver saying that they can leave the state of California, whether it go back to Texas uh, or to this treatment facility. And of course, Ryan wouldn't sign it. Wow. He, didn't ever, he really doesn't want this kid to get clean and sober because he wants him to be under his control. And, and that's the name of the game. So when that opportunity passed, it was... Anyway, now he's been to... This is his 15th program mm-hmm. that he's mm-hmm. in right now. Presently in... 2012. Oh my gosh. So that's the game that Farrah had to play with Ryan and that was this so-called love story that they've continued on for 30 years. According to Ryan. The last 14 or whatever it is, uh, I guess the last 13 years you'd say were because you know, he had this child. And she didn't want to leave California and move back to he a... He wasn't going to leave this child in this predicament because wow. you know, he's near death all the time. That's what a person who puts a needle in their arm is. You know, Ryan says in his book where he calls Griffin and Tatum to task for their drug addictions, which he seems to blame on their biological mother, Joanna Moore, who apparently was an addict and claiming that they were sort of hardwired, I guess, from her genetics. But he says that he isn't or hasn't been an addict, yet he was arrested in 
2008 for possession along with Redmond. What do you make of that claim? Well, he's a convicted felon, and uh, we have a saying in AA, you know, addict or an alcoholic, if their lips are moving, they're lying. Ah. So that's the way I look at Ryan O'Neill on a daily basis. And what, to your knowledge, did Farah think of the influence Griffin and Tatum had on Redmond when he was young? Because I'm assuming before he was a teenager, if those two adult children were in the house, Farah was very aware of what was going on and what they were bringing into the house or not? Oh, yeah. Well, there's another story, Tim, the National Enquirer, where Redmond is just so furious at his mother because, and I don't know if she did this uh, back when she had 3130 Antello, but this is what she did at the condo. If he brought friends to her house, she searched them and their bag that they brought with them before they were allowed in her house. Wow. She had an entryway that was off of the elevator, and she searched everybody. She just didn't allow drugs into her house. Now, wow. I think when she was still the head of her household on Antello, and if the, those kids were teenagers, they came to visit, she pretty much controlled, you know, her own house, and, and Redmond was he was small, and so I don't think she worried about it. But as far as the bad influence, that was, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back. Mm-hmm. Of course, was finding Ryan down at the uh, beach with a girl, the twenty-five year old, but. Up until that time, it was all about him doing drugs in front of this child over and over and over and over again. And since she had living servants, she pretty much had eyes and ears of what was going on while she was gone. Now, you weren't in touch with Farrah during the 80s when she was really with Ryan uninterrupted. You got back in touch with Farrah in the mid-90s. She filled you in on some of this. At- oh, yeah, she told me everything. I mean, I mean, we started seeing each other again in 1998, and we kind of caught up with each other's lives during those next 11 years. Mm-hmm. So I don't know where he comes off saying that they got back together, whether it was in 2000 or 2004, mm-hmm. the chasing pair of thing. But I was with her, and he wasn't there. It's interesting because we don't have the opportunity to read Farah's book because even though people wanted her to write a book, Judith Regan offered her millions. She didn't do it. But now we have Ryan's account where he portrays really them just being apart for a few years, her coming back to him when he was diagnosed with leukemia around 2001. Then we would see these moments of them together in Chasing Farah or Farah's story. But really in the 2000s, you're saying that she just was trying to appease him and they would just have these sort of photo moments together for the camera well, that's for what Ryan? He needed because that's his whole life. You know, he's on stage and he has to be associated with her so he'll have some kind of fame. And I just am saying that this book is a, is a fabrication because... I've got love letters all during this time. I've got phone records talking to her every day. And if somebody were to go to the Wilshire condo, they would see that my name is logged in when I come to visit. Mm -hmm. Where is he? Because he's not logged in to come to visit. The only time he comes to that condo is to drop that kid off when he is so sick that he either has to go to detox, a hospital, and then to treat every single time. That's the only time he shows up. You know, in Ryan's book, is there any other particular incident or attribute that he describes of Farah that you have particular issue with? Well, you know, this whole description of her as being angry and depressed and menopausal and all this other stuff is just another way for him to put her down because that's not the way I found her in 1998. And and I think that there are a lot of women who are as athletic as Farah don't go through menopause until much later in life. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, she wasn't in menopause and she was very sexual. So to say that that she became bored with him or whatever. It's just another way that he always does where he blames his own shortcomings on his children, on her, or whatever. But he always takes credit for whatever her... Um, Successes? Uh-huh. Saying he coached her for even the Apostle? Yeah, but he wasn't there because if you look again at the time frame, that's after 1997, 
and he's gone. And he's not around for the last Playboy shoot either, all of me. That's not true either. He's gone. He's out of the picture at that point. Because it was like at the end of 96, when they split, even though it wasn't technically announced until maybe early 97 in People Magazine. But that's your understanding that at the end of 96, that relationship was over as far as a love story. Another thing, Chris, is that the whole Letterman fiasco, that was the week that Farrah was notified that her child was missing. Okay. Wow. She had final cut on the All of Me video. She had to go to New York to do the Letterman and the uh, Howard Stern, and she'd never done either one, and she didn't know how she was going to be received. She had been working night and day, 24-7, on the editing of this film. It meant a lot to her because it was an art project, not just the nudity that David Letterman would like to portray it as to be. Mm-hmm. And once she got to New York, I mean, it was total chaos. There were 3,000 people outside the theater. There were all kinds of shenanigans going on inside. They edited all that out, so you don't see that David lost complete control of the audience. People are falling down, tripping over tables, and she's distracted. Wow. And she's also sick. You know, she's run down, and that's why... They don't know what she was going through. Well, see, there's stories that are starting to be planted in the globe for the next two, three years. That she was on drugs? That she was on drugs, and of course, her association with the O'Neills. So that's just not true. I mean, Farrah wouldn't do drugs with me in the 70s. Why at 50 would she all of a sudden start doing drugs? Right. I don't think so. She didn't even drink... You know, if somebody handed her a drink, she'd have a sip and put it down and never see it again. So, if anything, your feeling is that, or your knowledge is that she was just under tremendous stress, what was going on with her kid, what was going on with this project and the deadlines of it, and then she was put in this live TV crazy situation where she just resorted to sort of a dumb blonde routine, right? Right, because she didn't know David, and she realized that he was going to be ugly to her about the nudity in this uh, magazine, and she just went into this dumb blah that she used to play against uh, on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. With, you know, Johnny Carson, mm-hmm. and we'd play back, and they had a fun time because he knew how to handle comedy. So, mm-hmm. and also. Farrah told me, because she stayed in New York trying to get some kind of spin on this, she found out that there was a guy who was a reviewer of film and television and stuff like that, movies, that wrote an article that was just an attack on her based on what his wife had told him, her idea of what Farrah looked like and was acting like. And he wrote this salacious wow. review and he never saw it. Oh well, that God. went out all across the country, and that really started the bad press that Farrah had never had before. And I remember that vividly. And then finally, after I had developed this uh, really good rapport with Griffin, he told me that he'd been planting those stories uh, with his dad and getting paid for them about her In the uh, globe. drug addiction. In the globe. And that Ryan was involved? Griffin told you that? Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. my God. Wow. You know, Farrah seems sometimes to be an enigma because she could go into the light fluffy dumb blonde thing but yet we know that she was very shrewd as a businesswoman she didn't write her own book she didn't ever marry ryan o'neill and yet he had control over her affairs at the end if you could tell people in a few words or sentences who was farrah fawcett at her core as a person and as a businesswoman well she was a microbiology major when i met her in college mm-hmm. I and mean, that ought to tell you something about her no dumb blonde and then once she got to california i mean she probably had a few times where she was taken advantage of but i promise you by the time she uh, had those three or four contracts with fabergé and ultra bright and what have you Mm -hmm. she knew what the game was and she knew how to get paid Mm -hmm. and i mean when you think about it who at that time would be able to figure out how to get the rights to the poster after a year would revert back to her copyright. That's amazing. And she did that with both Playboy editions. All those pictures are owned by the Farrell Fawcett estate. Which, ironically, is now run by Ryan O'Neill's business manager, right. who Farrah didn't yeah. trust. <laughs> yeah, and by the way, all of the licensing now for her image a la Elvis, Mm -hmm. okay, goes into the foundation in perpetuity. Wow. It's very complicated, this whole thing with her estate and her legacy. You know, she might have had it so that her licensing of her image would go into a foundation, but believe me, 
it would be controlled by her son, not by Bernie Francis and his family. Mm-hmm. And so now we have, was it a $6 million estate? $6 million man, $6 million woman. Well, Ryan said it was 25 didn't he? Was that a joke? I mean, these are big discrepancies, and it'll be interesting to see if a lawsuit, an investigation by the California State Attorney General, if it will bridge the gap between these accounts and these numbers. Well, you've seen that signature that's on that document, right? It's been online. And you know what Colonel Fawcett's signature looked like. What do you think, Chris? Well, to talk about a discrepancy, I mean, that woman had some serious penmanship. I've seen autographs that she's dated 2006, 7, 8, 9. And that woman, when she wrote a letter, it was letter perfect with her Fs. and Absolutely. And personalized. And personalized. And then all of a sudden, we have a living trust that, that's not an initial page by page, is it? That document? No, it's 53 pages in front of a signature, by the way, where the date is different from the notary and from Pharaoh. Pharaoh didn't date it. And she dated everything that was an official document. Wow. Okay? We've seen online, and European media has covered your story, that you were definitely in touch with Farah and had an intimate relationship in her final years. I don't know why the U.S. media hasn't jumped on your story. I mean, what's your take? What's your experience well, with them giving you feedback? I, I had a real close relationship with Mike Pingle, who was Farrah's assistant. And Mike is, is an angel to me. He's the seventh angel, as a matter of fact. And he carried Farrah, absolutely carried her, to UCLA between when she was diagnosed on September the 22nd of 2006 until her birthday of the next year. Not Alana, not Mella, not Ryan, nobody else but Mike Pingle. And I trust Mike like there's just no tomorrow. So I called Mike after Easter during that week, and we got together, and I said, I have got to get some media involved in this because I can't get access to her, and her dad's too sick to participate in what's going on. And this was the week after the Easter was on Sunday. So Mike gave me a bunch of contacts with Mike's publicist, uh-huh. and I contacted, oh, 10 different media outlets, and every single one of these people were rude to me, they wanted to know what was my story, what did I want from this, uh-huh. da 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 And I would come to find out that 90% of them would call Alana first before they would get back to me, and then they would get back to me with this, we understand from uh, Miss Hamilton Stewart, that you're just a disgruntled boyfriend from 1965 who's out here to cash in on Farrah's death. Oh, wow. Wow. So a publicist for Ryan O'Neill and Alana Stewart had gone around before I ever got there and poisoned the well with these people because I guess they were smart enough to know I was coming. Were you ever featured in an E! True Hollywood story or anything like that that has been done? I did an E! True Hollywood story in August after Farrah died and they threw me onto the cutting room floor because the producer told me after I did two hours with her that they couldn't use me because Ryan O'Neill and Alana Stewart and Ella Murphy would refuse to participate in the piece. Whoa. I flew all the way to San Antonio, Texas to do that. I've had some experience through Three's Company and my Three's Company book and a and biographies and E! True Hollywood stories on John Ritter and Suzanne Summers to know that people who have access and control over images and video and the like can determine the biography of a celebrity or the participation of people in those projects. And now because so many iconic images of Farah, her image in essence is controlled by the estate which is controlled by Bernie Francis. Ryan O'Neill and people can determine if those images can be used in an hour or two hour show and so therefore they can determine who is part of the journalistic account of Farah's life. These are things people don't understand. Well they've sold this love story and of course the media's jumped on it because it sells. It's Farrah Fawcett and it's a love story of some 30 years which is a lie and uh, he sold it before I got there and he's pre-sold all this other stuff and and what's interesting now though is that he went around and you saw him on these TV shows portraying this book to be this love story and it is anything but and that's why I've come to refute him because I'm not going to let him get away with throwing her in the gutter 
That's where he belongs. Well, he's now, from what I hear, has either stage 2 or stage 4. For prostate cancer, there have been some discrepancies there. Do you think Ryan is getting to a point where he's maybe becoming reflective and starting to see things from other people's point of view and maybe gaining some compassion? you got to be kidding, right? Well, I don't know him. I mean, it didn't seem that way on The View or other media he's done recently. What do you make of who he is as well, a person? My dad died from prostate cancer. And I, oh. I was with him that whole last year that he fought through that. And I know what the stages are, and I know what's going to happen in the next five or six months. And we're going to see, you know, what Ryan O'Neill's made out of. Yeah. Because this is something he's not going to be able to just manipulate or whatever. This is now, he has to sit down with God and decide what's what. It's certainly quite a saga with what he's going through and what Farah went through. And you have this amazing story. Are we going to get to read your book one day? I just read recently that Alana Stewart has another book coming out about her own life. She's just going to keep on capitalizing on Pharaoh's name. It's just, I I just can't believe who would want to read anything about her. Her first book, (laughs) I don't think it did so hot, but my journey with Pharaoh. I'm going to write the real love story that was between Farah and me. Mm-hmm. And, and I predict that people will want to know the truth. I always think that people need to take everything into account. We've seen Alana's book. We've seen now Ryan's. You know, there are other people in Farah's life who were important and close that maybe haven't been featured in the media that have that bring other components in. And you certainly bring a huge component in in a relationship that spans 44 years. Do you have a, an estimated idea of when we'll be able to finally hear your story well, with Farah? I've written the first, say, five chapters. I've written the middle, and I've written the ending. And I just have to sit down with a writer, and we have to get it published. And uh, that's the hardest part, because I've just had an almost impossible... I, I've done several interviews uh, on television. You know, I've done interviews with OK Magazine, and I just can't get any traction. So I've got the story, and I've written most of it. I just need, you know, a publisher to have the cojones to saddle up and let's right. get this thing out, you know. And then I'm going to go out in the public, and, and people can ask me questions. Mm-hmm. I'll be around. Well, you've answered all of mine. In the meantime, I'm saying that the both of us is a crock of shit. Ryan's book. One other thing I wanted to ask you, Greg, about Farah, because there are times when she does seem enigmatic, uh, a woman who was so in control of so many parts of her career and her personal life, not marrying Ryan. She had so many strengths. Is there a weakness or a flaw that Farah had in human nature? Did she trust the wrong people? Well, I think that Farah was, you know, she she was a lot like my dad. She had an adventurous spirit, and she wanted to take people on first glance, you know? Mm-hmm. And then if you proved that you were not capable, then she was gone and never looked back. Mm-hmm. But I think she was very giving, and she was naive in a, in a certain extent. And I think that she fell in love a couple of times, and they didn't work out. And that happens to a lot of women in Hollywood. And uh, sure. I think it's more the nature of the men there than her weakness. Right. Because I'm a pretty strong man, and she loved me, and she never looked back on these other guys, you know? Mm-hmm. You take this child out of the equation, and it's just like Lee Major. She never saw Lee again for 25 years, didn't talk to him. She would have never had anything to do with Ryan O'Neill again if he didn't have her son. That is a very interesting point. And and another thing is, except for the 16 years that I chose, because she had a child in 1985 when I got out of the penitentiary, we were always together except when I made these two mistakes in my life. In the early 70s and the early 80s. 1972 and 1982. Just go back and look at your chronologically and, mm-hmm. and look at when she got married and look at when she started up with Ryan on that. Very interesting. It's, it's a map. It is. Is there anything else, Greg, that you want people to know about you, about Farah, about the truth of Farah and Ryan? We've covered so much here. Is there anything else you want to say in, in closing? No. No, not really. I just know that the truth will always come out, and uh, God's got a plan, and uh, I just have to uh, be patient, and uh, things are going to work out, and these people 
that have chosen to ride her fame and her legacy are just total fakes. Well, the truth does find a way of coming to the surface, and with lawsuits and investigations, those things seem to propel the truth upward eventually. So we will be watching and waiting to read your story, Greg. I appreciate your time here. Thanks, Chris.